It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Elizabeth Fleming, DDS. She's an experienced, comprehensive, and family dentist who has managed her private practice in Phoenix, Arizona for over 30 years. Working outside of private practice, she was clinical director for Dental Town Magazine uh, for two years, and while there, became profession in editing, writing, and recruiting authors for the publication. As an industry leader, Dr. Fleming continues to review dental products for Dental Products Shopper. In her home state of Arizona, her love of learning as well as the interaction with speakers as chair of the council for Western Regional Dental Experiences, experience stimulated her speaking career and the start of Quality Dental Voices. So it's great to see you. Nice to see you. Um, I know you uh, you live in Scottsdale, so I know it's uh, it's scary for you to drive down to Phoenix <laughs> where all the poor people live. I no. assume you're packing a, a 38 special in your purse. Uh, <laughs> did you were, were you uh, um, scared driving through Phoenix? No, what? no, no. It reminded me of actually coming to Dental Town. So I haven't been here for a few years, and uh, but it was it kind of reminded me of coming a few years ago. Don't you love it when you get off I-10 on Elliott and you see, you're high, so you see down on Ahwatukee in the mountain. I still think that's the most gorgeous view. Yeah, it is pretty. I, I love that view. So um, I'm so glad to get you on the show because, um, you know, the dental school classes are half women. And they don't want to listen to a, a short, fat, bold man like me who's practiced 30 years. They, they want to hear it from a woman. And you're, you're a, an, an, an amazing role model and leader for women dentists. Talk about your journey when you were in dental school. Was it half women? No, it was about 20% women. And actually at my school, I think that was a little higher than some of the other schools. I was at UOP in San Francisco. And uh, it actually um, has grown since then to be about 50% now. Who was your dean back then? Dagoni. Was he was Absolutely, he your dean? Yes. You know, um, there's only two dental schools on earth where people have nice things to say about their dean. It was Dagoni at UOP and Dillenburg at mm -hmm. AT Still. Most dental school deans, I mean, if you could have beat the crap out of them and not gone to jail, <laughs> what percent of the dentists would have would have done it? I mean, it seemed like it seemed like they were not there to help you. They were always right. there to, and I understand the time because it was more, um, and parents were the same. It was, it was a tough love. It was a boot camp mentality. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm really hard on you and push you hard and really be difficult. You'll be a great guy. And now it's kind of like more like, well, let's have a relationship with these students. And guess who has the far better donors? The UOP and the Yeah, the be, because when Creighton University, where I went undergrad, whenever I had a problem, you know, on each floor was a Jesuit priest who lived there. And the dean was like an 80, I think he was like 870,000 years old. Uh, <laughs> you could go to his office, talk to him. I mean, they, it was a relationship, you know. And they say if whenever Notre Dame writes a funding letter to their alumni, it's $10 million cash guaranteed. Wow. Which is so different than my experience in a public school, University of Missouri, where it was, you know, it was totally different. But that was a back a different time. But um, and and how is Dagoni doing? His wife just passed away. Yes, um, he. There is a different dean now at the school, but he's still involved um, and goes to their um, yearly meetings. So he's like ninety something. That is so cool. Yeah. Uh, are you going to practice till you're ninety? I doubt it. You doubt it. <laughs> um, so. Um, so yeah, so he was more progressive at that time because you graduated dental school in 84 mm -hmm. and 20%. I could see that with Dugoni in San Francisco, mm -hmm. but I couldn't see that in Kansas, Texas, in the- Any of the other schools maybe. Yeah, in the other states. Mm -hmm. But uh, so do you, do you think, um, so what do you, do you think now that the class is half women, we always hear these, um, these things, and I don't know how much of it comes from, um, I don't know where it comes from that, well, since they're girls, they're not gonna wanna own their own practice. They're gonna gonna wanna work for corporate, like uh, um, you know Heartland or Aspen or Pacific Dental. But when I go into those uh, DSOs, their number one problem is um, associate turnover. Mm -hmm. but, but I think a lot of recruiting goes into the dental schools and tells them a very different message, like, oh, you'll never compete against corporate, we're gonna take over half. And so, the, so a lot of what you're talking to, they're still in dental school or they're um, working um, as an associate. And what, what, what do you think is better um, for a super mom? So I do think that 
it's not necessarily because they're women that are going into corporate dentistry. I believe that they also, because of the loan structure, many of the outcoming graduates do not have the financial backing to immediately open up their own practice. So therefore, they will go into corporate to kind of get their feet wet and get some money to you know, survive before they take on more debt to start their own practice. So I, it may be because they're female, but I think more likely it's the, um, the debt that is causing them to go into that area. Uh, you had two amazing children. Absolutely, yes. Um, would you, if you wanted, obviously um, our children come before our work. Mm -hmm. Do you think um, it's easier to be uh, a great parent um, being an eight to five employee and then when five o'clock go home and work on your kids or looking back at your career, did you think you were a better parent because you owned your own business and could do whatever you want? Um, that's a difficult question. I think that you have to have a good partner to help because your role is not the traditional um, eight to five housewife role. You have a business to run and then you know, kids to raise, a house to maintain, a marriage to maintain. So I think that it's difficult, it's a little bit more difficult for a female to have a practice and be a parent. There, you know, you're dealing with a lot of things. You think it's more difficult for a woman dentist to own her own business and raise kids than a male dentist to own his own business and raise kids? Yes. And because of the traditional roles. Right. And so you must, as a female dentist, have a supportive partner because raising the kids is not all on your shoulders. It can't be all on your shoulders if you have a business as well as kids. And Betty, it's, it's sad because, um, I mean, everybody points to, okay, Saudi Arabia just legalized this year women could drive. Wow. And um, so it's easy to look at that and say, you know, that they, they were behind the time. They should have let them do that years ago. But people don't realize how much sexism is still around today. I mean, I know, I, I mean, I've had, I've had a woman dentist in this room bawl her eyes out because she owned her own business here. She was doing great. Her husband made like $70,000 a year, but got a promotion to like manager and 80,000. He said, come on, we're, we're moving. She's like, are you, are you out of your mind? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I can't pick up my, and he, and it, and it was basically you're going or you're staying here. And so she had to swallow her pride to save the family and, and all this stuff. And I, and I, a lot of times when you're at dinner and it's a man and woman uh, couple, I say, in all honesty, after work, um, who's cooking, cleaning, doing the homework, and she says, he just drinks beer and watches ESPN. <laughs> and I do all the cooking, all the cleaning, all, you know, so there's still there's a still massive else. amount of sexism still left to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that is very difficult if you are a female business owner. And um, so luckily my husband um, has no role separation between doing any of the normal everyday situations with raising kids, changing diapers, you know, transporting the kids, picking them up. So I think there has to be a lot of that in order to make it work. But can you honestly say if you had to do it over again, you would have had no children and oh, stayed no, single? Oh, no, no, no. I would. Oh, I love, tell the truth. It's going to uncensored. Oh. You would have stayed single with no. No, I'm just kidding. No, no, just no, no. No, no it's, it's nice now because my kids are 24, or 23 and 25, and they're actually decent people. So it's like, wow, we did something right, you know? All right, and, I know. And so, yeah, it wasn't always easy, but... Um, there's I can't say that Ryan's in. decent, <laughs> uh, but he does have a pulse. He is alive. Uh, no, yeah, I mean, I, 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 the, I mean, the only four accomplishments I did was Eric Gray, Ryan, and Zach. The rest is trivial pursuit. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and as much as you uh, can get frustrated by your children, the reward is a grandchild. And uh, my gosh, I mean, I got uh, grandchildren. But um, so, um, what? So you would tell. Um, those young kids um, that when they get out of school, um, it's kind of like football. When you, when you lose a game 50 to nothing, you don't come back and teach them these complicated flea flicker plays. You come back to the four basics. You didn't block. You didn't tackle. You didn't throw the ball. You didn't catch it. You know, you go mm -hmm. back to basics. They come out of school. They need to go get a job and do fillings and single mm -hmm. crowns, and they need to get that. They, they need to get, you know, 
x-rays, cleanings, exams, fillings, crowns. They need, they need to get that down. The basics down. Before they start wanting to place implants and do sinus lifts and learn Absolutely. Invisalign and I mean all this stuff like that. So what would your advice be? Th that to get an associate job for a year or two or? If, yeah, if there's an associate job that is out there, that would be good. Most of the time the associate jobs do not seem to last for a long time period, almost like the corporate. So they come in, kind of get their feet wet, get some education on how maybe to run a business, and then possibly go and do something on their own. However, sometimes there can also be um, associates that maybe are female and maybe they want to take time off to have kids. So they may not want to step into owning the private practice. Maybe they do want to stay at corporate or an associateship for a little while while they have their kids and raise their kids. They don't have that much responsibility as they would owning a practice. Wouldn't it be a lot easier though just to get a cat? <laughs> it would, but most people, you know, in fact, I wouldn't, even get the, the I wouldn't even get the goldfish. I'd get a picture of a goldfish. <laughs> um, but you know, that, that employee turnover deal is a millennial though. So my mom's brother, lives up the street and he got a job with Mo at Mobile Oil when he was 16 and he retired there and he was 66. I just saw a, a, a um, study, uh, millennials are very, very different at the greatest companies to work for um, and the highest um, PE earnings of like 29 on Wall Street, Fang, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google. Microsoft, uh, Google. Their average millennial stays only one to two years. Mm -hmm. So you're working at Facebook, which gives you free lunches and foosball and every perk in the world. And after a year or two, someone comes and taps on the show and says, hey, you want to jump over to Uber and work on driverless cars? And they're like, you know what? I've been doing the same thing for two years. It was fun. I got it. But yeah, I want to, I want to get a new experience. And then someone will come along and say, hey, you want to jump over to Amazon and learn you know, what they're doing? And, you know. So they're just chasing their own what's hot next. Whereas the baby boomers, I mean, they, they got a job at GM or Honda or and Toyota stay and stayed there a lifetime. So mm -hmm. lifetime employment is not something, there's no, mm -hmm. and when people always talk about the high turnover of associates, I think the, the longest, the, who's keeping the longest, what I hear on the street is Heartland at two years, like Facebook mm -hmm. holds them the longest at two years. Apple, it's, I mean, yeah, uh, Amazon with Jeff Bezos, mm -hmm. not even one year. Wow. His average millennial gets a job with them and with, before a year quits. And they all say the same thing, burned out, fried. You know, they just... you know what's interesting is my son got out of school as an engineer. And right now he is working for a uh, spinoff company for, for Google doing driverless cars here in Chandler. And he loves it. He, you know, now, is that Waymo? Waymo. He works for he Waymo. He works for Waymo? Yes. Now, tell, tell us about what, what is Waymo? Waymo is a division of Google. Okay, okay. And so the division is actually to do driverless cars. And they did, um, he Can was- Can you send me the link to Waymo? He was in um, um, the car as they were doing their research and whatever else. So he was in the car, but the car was actually driving. And if it had a problem, then he was there to take over the wheel. And so um, he has, um, a lot, a large group of young people, the millennials that he works with, they play ping pong when they have, you know, spare time and they just have all the snacks. And, and I said, this is not reality. You know, this is not how companies are. And so, but he loves it. He has a good time. So Google chose, out of all the cities, they chose Phoenix. You guys won't believe this, but it start, starting a year ago, I mean, I see one in Ahwatukee every third day. Mm -hmm. Now they're not they're just testing it. There's no drive. There's no such thing as a driverless car today. They do have. You can get rides from a driverless car. So they've progressed beyond having um, someone maintain it. I believe you can almost like Uber. You know, have the car come and pick you up and take you to a place. So Waymo has a self-driving car that could come pick me up. Hey, tell him um, anybody's in charge of that. I, I have another podcast just for. Uh, my town of Ahwatukee, oh. I would love to podcast them from Waymo because we see them all the time. And um, I mean, I, I see them all the time. Are you seeing them? Now you live in North Phoenix, but you live in Scottsdale. Right. I see them in Scottsdale when I go to say the um, ASDA organizational building. They're in Scottsdale all the time. And so, you know, like you might see three of them in a row at a stoplight or something. So 
They're, they are very prevalent now, um, and you know they've just. He's worked there probably a year, so he's coming up upon the. <laughs> you think? He'll, but you think he'll stay no. with Google for forty years? No, no. Um, and I think though he might um, transition into a different job capacity. But uh, one of his best friends is moving to Mountain View, where the main Google. Um, building is or you know they have a compound with multiple buildings um but he's moving there today yeah and it's so sad because the founder of google sergey brin larry page sergey brin was a russian and the the um it's it's we're not attracting the immigrants anymore there's so many blocks to get all these people and you look at all these great companies and they were started by by immigrants i mean especially mm. in silicon valley Oh, yeah. And when someone has an idea where they want to leave their mother country and go to the other side of the world to start a business, that's a passionate person. Oh, yeah. And you should be meeting them at the at the border with flowers and roses. <laughs> Welcoming them. Not harass, you know, Welcome not making it, it so difficult. Um, when you and I started up, um, you started in 84, mm -hmm. um, and I was in 87. There was no fluoride in the water. There were no mm -hmm. dental schools. Our neighboring states, Utah, had no dental school. Nevada had no dental school. Now we have a big dental school in Glendale, dumping out 100 dentists a year. Uh, we have one in Mesa, graduating 70 a year. Um, Utah has two, uh, Rosemary and University of Utah. Um, Nevada has one in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it fair when she graduated from school and says, Betty, Howie, it was a lot easier 30 years ago uh, than now. We have far much more competition and far more student loan. Do you think that's fair, or do you think the golden years of dentistry are still here? Um, I think they've evolved. I'm, I wouldn't say that we didn't have problems such as the interest rate and things that when we graduated were major blocks to you know, starting up. Um, but I think if you go with, say, the technology and the internet and doing the things that are now prevalent that weren't here when we graduated, you have a fair chance to, to do well. I think you and I both agree. When I look back at 30 years, the number one variable I saw to success was the hours of CE you took. The guys who uh, joined up the AGD and got their FAGD, their, you know, if they, were, if they were listening, if they were feeding their brain with 100 hours of CE a year, they always found something they loved. They always got good at something. They always got, they were always passionate. And so I was really excited when you started uh, Quality Dental Voices. Um, what, tell us about your journey. What made you start Quality Dental Voices? And why would you do Quality Dental Voices when I have a voice for podcast and iTunes? You have a face. You could be on YouTube. You, you, don't have, <laughs> you should be Quality Dental Videos. Well, it's not necessarily in relation to me speaking about on videos or podcasts or anything like that. <laughs> um, what Quality Dental Voices is is a dental speakers bureau. And being that I was involved in the planning of the Arizona meeting for a number of years, I was on a convention that um, obtained the speakers and um, introduced the speakers. I got a lot of... Um, um, interest in in actually helping the speakers to become better at what they're doing maybe get booked at some of the other meetings outside of arizona and i also became a dental speaker myself so um quality dental voices is a speakers bureau and i will help to get the people booked in various meetings and have a resource for the people that are planning the meetings to go to to uh, find out about what topics are available and what speakers we have on Quality Dental Voices. Well, well tell us about the May 5th event that we just retweeted. So there is an event coming called Action to Win Dental Leaders, Dentistry Leaders, and it involves a number of people that we feel are leaders in dentistry, and it will be a fast-paced um, lecture, question and answer period, um, involving probably 12 speakers and um, Emily Latron is a speaker out of California and she's a dentist as well. She has quite a story and she is um, doing coaching for dentists um, in a leadership capacity. We also have Sharon Lecter who is 
a financial wizard, has written 23 books on finances. She will be attending and lecturing as well. And a number of female dentists, including um, um, Grace Zimmerman, who is the uh, has a Facebook group, Women Dentist in Business, Mommy Dentist in Business. Oh, I think I've heard. What's her name? Grace Fleming? Grace Zimmerman. Grace Zimmerman. Grace Zimmerman. And we have, um, um, let me think, Gina Dorfman of Yappy. Oh, Dental. yeah. Um, Ryan, can you send me the link for Grace Zimmerman? She has a, a Facebook group, Mommy Dentist in Business. So I'd have to get an operation to join that group. You might have to. I don't. You know, it's mostly women talking about women, women stuff. Yeah, moms. Um, so and and you also on that group is my classmate from UMKC Dental School, John Flukey. Absolutely, yes. We were both uh, class of '87, and uh -huh. he, and uh, he's uh, big in dental media too. Uh, with is he's a, with Dental Product Journal. Dental Product Journal dental. or Dental Products and Report. Dental Products. I forget which one it is. I, I, think, I think it's DPR. I think it's Dental Products and Report. Yeah. But uh, he was a uh, so fun to go through dental school. It's so smart. Emily, love Emily. Mm -hmm. uh, Ron Shelbourne is one of your guys. Roy Shelbourne. Roy. Mm -hmm. The guy who uh, went to jail for Medicaid fraud. Yes. Delia Tuttle. Uh, so, so he was in dentistry. So, so this is more a consulting company for people who want to be speakers, or is it more... For it's existing for speakers existing who want to speak more? Who want to speak more and kind of get the word out. Maybe they are speaking, maybe they don't have time to publicize themselves. And being that I have um, worked on the other side obtaining speakers for our meeting here, I have kind of some inside information to possibly get the word out on the speakers and to get them booked at some of the meetings. Nice. So, how, how old is this company? It's brand new. It's brand new. Brand new. And, and you heard it first <laughs> on Dentistry Uncensored. Well, that, that is awesome. Anything I can uh, help with on that, just l let me know. Uh, if um, um, in, in Anything I can do that. Um, so what, do you, um, what, what, what advice would you give them out of, out of school? I would say that you learn things in dental school, but once you get out, there's so much more information that you don't learn in school. And... You have to learn on your own. So therefore, you have to go to CE, and you have to take classes to further your education. Be a you know, continuous student. It never ends. And that's how I got involved in doing the CE for Arizona, because it was like, we're always in these meetings. And I wanted to do more, especially after my kids grew up, that um, I started volunteering for the Dental Association. Yeah, and, and by the way, um it does irk me when I see people um, throwing the uh, the American Dental Association under a bus and, and not joining or whatever. Um, you know, what what percent are our members? Is it about seventy percent? Is it is that the number you're here? Yeah, I am not sure, but I go to a lot of meetings, and that's one of the questions I always ask. Do you go to your local meeting? Yeah, are you so, a member? So, yeah. So the the ADA is like your parents. I mean, you know, they're the only ones you got. You know, your parents aren't perfect, but then you got to think, well, were their parents perfect? I mean, you go back past your grandma, great grandma. I mean, I just did that 23 and me DNA Oh, did analysis. you? I'm 4.3% Neanderthal. <laughs> so if I think my mom and dad weren't perfect, imagine how many generations back when we were Neanderthal, they were probably eating their children. Um, you know, um, so um, the ADA, when people start batting around the ADA, I mean, what percent? of the uh, man hours is volunteers quite a large amount I, oh yeah i mean i know guys like like you i mean how many how many hours of your time have you spent at the arizona dental association um i would say probably eight meetings a year plus the convention so you know probably 50 50 hours or so yeah i mean i mean so i mean so when, when you throw the 80 under your bus you're, you're throwing Thousands of buddies under a bus who are <laughs> down there. It, it's it's kind of like your church. I mean, uh, you go to your church. Well, you know, there's crazy people in your church. There's crazy uh, um, priests. There's crazy. You know, it, it's a it's a um, it's a commitment. But what I but what they don't see, and this this is what I always uh, like when I had Kevin Earl on the show. 
If I had one piece of advice for the ADA is they don't, the, the, the due paying member doesn't realize all they do all the benefits. behind the scenes uh, with the government. I mean, this mm -hmm. is the United States where we have one million attorneys and the only way you get a bill passed is with the water bills. And if you're not down there bribing and giving money and raising money and things that, that, that um, they, they don't realize that you're a sovereign profession. I mean, look at when well, we were in Malaysia. They had one dental school forever. Then private dental schools come in. Now, now they have 10. You, you go from one to 10, it changes everything. And there's so many things um, that um, our government is trying to do and not do and undo. And if you didn't have all those lobbyists in 50 different states and in Washington, D.C., then your, all the time and money and investment you put into your sovereign profession could, could be really damaged. I mean, do you agree? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And, and, and then as far as what they don't like, um, look, look on dental time. You couldn't get two dentists to agree that today is Sunday. I mean, you, <laughs> you post any case. I mean, you, you, you could post a beautiful case, beautiful teeth, beautiful woman. And one guy will say, I do veneers. You know, the other one, you know, and she needs Invisalign. I mean, they, they, they're not an agreeable bunch. Um, Whenever you have eight years of college, dentists, physicians, and lawyers, it's like herding cats. Mm -hmm. If you want to get everybody on your team, like in the military, they want boys under 21. They don't want a bunch of 50-year-olds who think they know how to win a war. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, Walmart is the largest employer in America, and if you want to have the most number of employees, you should shoot for um, the lowest amount of education because the lowest amount of education, they'll line up and listen to you. But you can't get 50 dentists or lawyers or physicians in a room and have them agree on anything. Um, I want to switch to a whole different topic. Um, when they come out of school, $350,000 in debt, and then they hear, well, if I want to be a really great dentist, i got to have a CIRAC machine, a CAD cam, or i got to have um, seventy-five dollars to $150,000 laser, millennial laser for LANAP, or... Um, or I gotta buy a CBCT. I mean, they could literally come out of school, make three purchases, mm -hmm. and double their debt. You've had a very successful dental office business in North Phoenix for 30 years. What expensive toys do you think are a must have and a return on investment? And which ones do you think you can survive and thrive without? I like my scanner. I don't have the mill. I just have a scanner. So I would say that's probably a um, must-have situation What's, now. What scanner do you have? I have an iTero. An iTero. Now, is that the one? Is iTero, is that what um, Align Technology, Invisalign bought? Mm -hmm. So Align Technology owns Invisalign and iTero. Yes. And um, so, you, and I, okay, and you... How much did you pay for that? How long ago did you buy it? Um, it was, I don't remember how much it was. Um, I'm still paying on it. I have probably another year to go, and I probably bought it about three years ago. No buyer's remorse? You're glad you bought it? No, I'm glad I bought it. And Are you using it for Crown and Bridge or Crown for Invisalign? Bridge, Crown and Bridge only. And um, I don't do much Invisalign. I do more six-month smiles than I do Invisalign. And so I think learning... Six Month Smiles. That was Ryan Swain. Uh huh. Six Month Smiles. And so um, I like the ability to um, get a more predictable end result with using wires and brackets and the fact that they're white. Um, you know, people have a tendency to, to go towards that. If they like Invisalign, I will have them um, go to the orthodontist and get their options and see whether. Now, do you work with just one orthodontist, or do you work with several? I work with several. Yeah. And I work with several specialists in a variety of uh, capacities, and uh, there's a lot of good ones out there. So I, I'm you, just curious. Um, why do you have iTero and not doing business? You just was dumb, and you do six month smiles. I mean, you you have. I could do iTero. I use uh, iTero for Invisalign. Um, I just. Um, have not gotten into it to that extent. I have sent more of the patients when they want uh, major corrections to the orthodontist. So it's kind of interesting. So you and I have seen this rodeo twice. Um, bleaching, um, I think I did. I, I might have done the first bleaching case only because it was David Keel 
Remember, it was a company out of Arkansas. It was, oh, wow. um, God, what was the name of that company that came here in 87? And you could buy six bottles of bleach for $900. And it was Carbama. It was Omni, oh, Carbama Omni Peroxide. Yeah, Carbama, oh, Omni yeah, yeah. Gel. Okay. Remember Omni Gel? Okay. And it was out of Arkansas. And just out of random chaos, he, when he uh, moved here from Arkansas, he bought a house across the street. And I see this big dental supply yellow van, Omni, <laughs> and and uh, and I told him there's no way I was gonna you know spend nine hundred dollars nine hundred dollars yeah. thirty years ago. Yeah. That was that was bank. So he gave me a set and told me to go to work and uh, bleach everybody's upper teeth. And I was back there calling Gordon Christian. You know, is there any research on this? And everybody's like, no, it's brand new. It's a uh, carbamide peroxide. It's thixotropic. You know, Gordon basically said, you know what, an elephant's tusk. Is a is a lateral incisor. Um, it's ivory is enamel. I don't I don't see how this is going to hurt it. And I said, well, um, so I just said, do you, do you think I uh, it's okay I for do me this. to do this on me and my staff? <laughs> so me and the staff all bleach everything, and they were just like all white, and the lores were all brown. Oh my god, <laughs> we were selling the bejesus out of it because everybody in the office had beautiful white beautiful teeth. upper white teeth yeah. and lower brown teeth and. And I remember Dave used to always come in and say, you guys, you need to fill up your lower tray with like Dr. Pepper and syrup, and, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but it was, um, it was an amazing deal. And we charged two fifty dollars an arch, it was $500. And it was crazy fun, easy money. And what I liked about it is the way you manage humans, if they like something, they'll do it. Like, like they either own a bowling ball and they're in a league, or they haven't bowled one time in 10 years. Mm -hmm. They either own a boat and go to the lake all the time, or they haven't been to the lake in 10 years. And when people don't like their teeth, and they don't, they're not in love with their teeth, they don't take care of them, they don't brush them, they don't floss them, but what I was noticing with the bleaching is as soon as little Sam or, or Sally liked her smile, then she wanted to brush, then she wanted to floss, then she, then she wanted, wanted to get her fix, and yeah. she, so it was kind of like, um, you know, they, it turned them on, but then Crest came out. Mm -hmm. and just wipe that industry away with $50 crest slips. And Invisalign uh, now has bought 17% of Smiles Direct, and now they're setting up stores. They're taking a, uh, a page out of uh, Steve Jobs. When everybody was getting out of retail, they are all zigging out. Steve Jobs, one of the m number one marketing geniuses of our lifetime, started, by, started building these Apple stores mm -hmm. that were monuments to the brand, and I mean, um, I mean, the iPhone, not in sales, but just profit dollars, the iPhone makes uh, 10 times more profit dollars than the uh, Samsungs do. And now you see iTero, um, or uh, Align Technology, going into these really high-end malls, and they're gonna do Invisalign Direct. Wow. I mean, they, they buy Cut us out. Yeah, they, they <laughs> cut us out. So, um, you know, we've all seen this before. How do you think that's gonna play? Um, well, I don't know. What do your orthodontist friends say? Do they talk about it? Um, I haven't talked to anybody about it at this point, but I know, I remember when Clear Choice started with the um, implant centers relatively close by the dentist, and um, I have one in my parking lot, a Clear Choice, you know, right across really? the parking lot from me. And it doesn't seem to have affected the implant business because it's um, a little bit different than say the multiple people that come in my practice that me need maybe one implant or an implant bridge. They don't have major failures and need full mouth implants. Well, you know, I, the way I see it is um, when Clear Choice came here, I mean, how many ads were they buying on TV? How oh, many yeah. infomercials? I mean, to Full me- Full page ads in the paper. It seemed to me, a rising, I, I don't think in fear and scarcity, I'm just not that guy. I think in hope, growth, abundance, and I look at what percent of Americans technically could have straighter teeth with it, with clear liners, like Invisalign. A lot. 90% yeah. of all adults. <laughs> uh -huh. I mean, so I think the orthodontic market can just explode. Mm -hmm. And what I saw with the clear choices, I, I mean, they, they are the rising tide. They've done so much advertising that our individual oral surgeons and periodontists don't do. Mm -hmm. And they've done so many infomercials. I mean, I can't tell you how many times flipping through the channels, you know, I've seen some 30 minute deal um, on, on, on all on four. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, I, I think they actually, I think they grow the market segment. Mm -hmm. You know? And, and I, I think that people, uh, consumers, will gravitate towards something that's easier than maybe going to a dental office. So they'll probably gravitate there. I don't think it's going to stay a, a method of um, having your trays done by a retail store. I, I, I think we can give them a lot better customer service in the dental field yeah. than they can in a store. And it'll make everybody revise with the price. I mean, I always say that on braces, um, it's kind of been like uh, airlines. I mean, in my whole life, I mean, every time Boeing comes out with a new plane, well, it still only flies 550 miles an hour. It's still, you know, it, it's tough when you lecture. I mean, like every time I lecture in India, I have a five hour flight to New York, way over, 15 hour flight to New Delhi. You get them lectured to a couple hundred people and then backtrack, then 15 <laughs> hours back here. I mean, I've lectured in Australia. I mean, Ryan, what was that flight? What are those flights like from Australia? Oh, they're long. Oh, my God. You take off Sydney and they go, flight time today? 16 hours? 12? And you're like, 16 hours? I mean, after, <laughs> I mean, you can get drunk and sober back up and get drunk again yeah. and go to sleep. I mean, you can, I mean, it's crazy. So, you know, it's like every time you have to make it worthwhile if you go oh my God. lecture in. Uh, Australia or India? No, I, no? I just, I mean, I, first time <laughs> I lectured in Australia, I got off work, true story, I got off work, five o'clock Friday, went to Sky Harbor, flew to LA, had a layover, flew 16 hours to uh, Sydney, got there like six in the morning, they picked me up, took me to the convention center, lectured eight to five, Ooh. then after the seminar, they drove me back to the airport, <laughs> I had like a nine o'clock return flight, and I was going through the deal, and they, they I'll never forget this guy, he's looking at my gun, he goes, you weren't even here 12 hours. <laughs> He's like, and he goes, I've never seen that. And I, uh, I'm married. I got four kids. I got an office. I, you know, I don't have time to pet kangaroos. And, uh, yeah, those are just uh, the, brutal. The, the worst one we ever had. Remember the worst one? We called it the death march. Oh, yeah. Too was hard. it Cambodia or Malaysia? We eventually were going to um, Indonesia, but we had a couple layovers. We had a layover in Japan was, and a layover in Singapore. We left the house. Wow. And it was uh, me, Greg, Ryan. That's it. Just us three? Yeah. By the time we checked in our hotel room, 36 hours. Oh, oh I mean, it's, it's brutal. That's why I love the podcast. Yeah. When I, when I look at these numbers, it's like, oh, my God, we're lecturing to more people today in India, and I don't have to 15-hour flight it from, from New York to New Delhi. I mean, that, just, uh, that is so cool. But um, so I think, um, yeah, you know, the all-in-4 deal, I don't know um, really how. I mean, it's totally American. Or if you have the money, you can just get instant teeth. I mean, there's going to be a market for that. But I see so many all in fours where, well, why did you lose all your teeth? Right. You know, you weren't the uh, vegan yoga instructor. You know, you were probably smoking, drinking, not brushing, hadn't been dentist. And those all in fours, and I, I keep seeing these uh, implant cases where in five years, the literature is saying 20% have hair implantitis. At nine years, the research comes in like 40 to 60% wow. But when I see those all on four um, zest attachments, those ball and rings, you know, they snap into place. Well, then grandpa can go in the bathroom twice a day, pop that thing out, mm -hmm. rinse it out, brush it. Whereas when I see them in the office, they come in, they got an entire ham sandwich underneath this all on four <laughs> thing. I was trying to get the CEO of water pick to come on um, because um, I think that what I got really excited about water pick is um, water pick is uh, mom doesn't like it when you make a mess in the bathroom. And I've always said it's got to be in the bathroom. Shower. And we, I always had the shower floss where you unscrew mm -hmm. the head. You put your floss down because if you want a water pick, you don't want all these water spots on the mirror, and you know you don't want to be blowing a ham sandwich onto your <laughs> under your mirror. Um, and now they have the portable ones because I think um, if they're going to do it in their shower, it'll get done. But if they got to open up the um, the uh, underneath the sink and get out a box and plug it in and then make a big old mess, you know, and clean the mirror, it, it's just not going to get done. But you know you can uh, do it in the shower. I mean, I mean, right now they're already all your patients are already peeing in the shower. So what is it to just add shower flossing? You know what I mean? But um, I, I I really wish um, dentists were more um, telling these people. You know what? I can get all your teeth and they're all on four. We can do it in a day. But I don't know if I'm really going to change your behavior. So be honest with yourself. I mean, do you really see yourself 
really getting underneath there and taking care of it every single day. Because if not, I think 10 years later, you're going to be back same place with periimplantitis. Um, you also, um, you lecture on lasers. Um, what, what are your thoughts on uh, diode laser procedures? So that's kind of an interesting story. I um, had an event here where Dr. Tuttle, Delia Tuttle, who is Divas in Dentistry, um, had asked me to um, help her speak in various areas in the US. She's very popular in Europe and has done quite a few Where's Where was lectures. she born and raised? Was it Romania? Romania. Romania. Uh-huh. And um, so when she had her um, event here, she did her gumdrop technique event here in um, Phoenix, or actually in Scottsdale. And when she came to that event, um, I lectured on diode lasers. And I worked with Ultradent and they lent their Gemini laser, and we had a lecture workshop, and now that has evolved into, I will be speaking at Ultradent for their uh, Women in Dentistry series where they have icons in dentistry happening in June, um, and nice. I will be speaking, see, I'll be speaking on nice. lasers for them, and um, they just announced that a couple days ago on International Women's Day. Well, and how much is a Gemini laser? Um, I think they're between 6,000 and 7,000 maybe, and it's a um, dual wavelength laser, and the other ones are all one wavelength, and so it has, it's more efficient, it cuts faster and, and not as hot, so it has a lot of pluses to have the dual wavelength, plus they have a really nice, um, um, face of it where you can just it's a touch screen and it's very easy to use so um, they've lent me one I'm doing lots of little videos and and informational things for my upcoming lecture you know there's two sides of laser I mean I know people who on molars basically quit packing cord when they got a laser but mm -hmm. I got a buddy and um, he's a podiatrist and um, he says he could take a 15 blade, make that incision, get a big old, you know, electric handpiece and do his surgery and all that stuff. But he uses a laser, which he says makes the incision go from mm -hmm. a 15 blade being to take a mm -hmm. long time. Because he says the marketing on it is, is insane. And when people are searching podi uh, podiatry surgery mm -hmm. and they see his laser, laser, yes, laser, exactly. laser you're thinking Obi-Wan Kenobi and C-3PO and you know. I actually have something in my laser lecture that's like doo, 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 doo. you know that's yeah. how you perceive yeah. a laser, a laser um, works but um, I actually have a patient that had had the scalpel surgery for some frenum attachments um, a couple years prior, and her orthodontist referred her into my office to have the laser um, phrenectomy done because they didn't succeed with the phrenectomy that was done with the scalpel. So um, I've documented her case, and she told me that the pain level is so much less with the laser. And so um, it's, it is a lot better technology than the scalpel or the electrosurge for doing procedures. Um, in my opinion. In my opinion, the only patients who are not used to dealing with pain, they're, they're all the single people. But uh, the married people, you could just <laughs> hit them over the head with a shovel and they're like, oh. well, but you know, but you know, I, I have so many mixed feelings about the laser and the front of attachment. So, um, you know, the orthodontists never talk about this. It's coming to dentistry from anthropologists, but, and by the way, ASU, um, where I went, um, has Lucy, the oldest hominid, um, 1.6 million years old, 36 inch tall female. She was 17, her wisdom teeth weren't all the way in yet. But all the anthropologists are saying, why are there no malocclusions for, you know, millions of years? And they just found a tooth in uh, Germany, which blows everybody's mind. They just found a 9.6 million year old human tooth wow. in a cave next to the river in Germany. Because before that, they were all from Eastern Africa. So everybody thought, well, that was the cradle of civilization, mm -hmm. which didn't always really make sense because the first city that reached a million was actually Rome. That was the first city with a million people. And this was next door in Germany. Mm -hmm. They found a 9.6 million. But, but malocclusions, they, they, they don't exist 
with um, until about 300 years ago, and a lot of the um, a lot of the things I'm reading are saying because when you um, when the baby was born, they nursed for years, and today. Um, if the nursing gets fairly difficult, they just stop doing it and give them a sippy cup so they don't have all those forces spreading their face. You probably threw them a, um, a mastodon leg and these kids were, <laughs> just they had all these forces and now you're feeding them, you know, puree applesauce out of a baby Gerber jar. Formula. And giving them uh, sippy cups and, and bottles that, you know, you just can just milk comes out like a garden hose with no effort. So now I have, um, and getting a lot of questions because these nursing uh, mothers, so now they're sending someone into the hospital when you have a baby to give you nursing instructions. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are looking at this kid's uh, um, freedom attachments and saying, you need to get that lasered off. So then if I, so I was always saying, no, I'm not gonna go there, you go, go see a pediatric dentist. But the problem with the pediatric dentist is, you know, some are very, going along with the, the, the nursing coaches in the hospitals and other ones are very against it. So then you're going to be back at square one because she's going to call you back a week later and say, well, you know, I talked to two guys and one's for it, one's against it. I want to know what you think. So I want to know what you think since... Uh, so you have to go to a female pediatric dentist and she will do what's right for the baby. No, um, I'm No, just I agree. <laughs> no, I agree because, no, Dr. seriously... Dr. Jeanette McLean, you yes, know? Because seriously, um, they always say there's a lot of truth behind humors, right? <laughs> so um, the um, when I was little, all the OBGYNs were males. Mm -hmm. They didn't listen to their patients and they the males called them hysterical which is a Greek word meaning <laughs> uterus, hysterus. Oh. So, I mean, when you tell me a complaint, I call you a uterus, now all the OBGYNs are men, are women. And in when I go into a dental school and I see a pediatric graduate program, I mean, it's, it's like all women. Mm -hmm. And I think if women make 90% of all appointments, I think women have a huge advantage because um, what percent of women don't trust men? I mean, let me give you a couple examples. Like out here, the biggest air conditioning deal is George Brazil, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, who just passed away a couple of years ago. Just a great guy. But when, George, when you, your air conditioning doesn't work and you call George Brazil or an air conditioning company, they come up and they say, Betty, we can't fix your air conditioner. You need a brand new air conditioner for $9,000. What percent of the women in Phoenix are wondering, I wonder if that's true. Mm -hmm. What percent of the time when women pull up at the oil change deal where it says, oil change 1999, so you're thinking, I got a 20. Mm -hmm. And then he walks out and says, well, Betty, we need to change your air filter and flush out your transmission fluid. What percent of the women think, you're just trying to sell me something? What, what percent would you say? Oh, I would say it's pretty high. Yeah, mm -hmm. when the engine light comes on, the mechanics call the engine light, the mechanics call it the idiot light. Mm -hmm. They're like, awesome, the idiot light went off. She's going to come in. We can sell her anything. So I think it's absolutely true. If I was a woman, I would want to go to a female pediatric dentist who nursed her own kids mm -hmm. to answer that question. Not me. You know, I, if, I, if I was a woman, I wouldn't go to a male OBGYN. You know, just like when I got my vasectomy done, that was my only surgery. And, um, you know, I, I went to a man. I mean, I, you know. I have to tell you an interesting story. So um, just the other day, my cat, I had to take my cat to the vet for um, shots, year shots. And so I take- For what shots? For shots, yearly shots. She's okay. like a year and a half, two years old. And I take her in and I have a vet that I've been going to for years and years. There's a male and a female vet. So the female vet looks at my cat and says, oh, she's got a couple minor things we need to put her on medication. But she looked in her mouth and she said, she has gingivitis. And I said, okay. And so she said, so we'll have to check on, you know, what she was being treated for in a couple weeks, but also we need to clean her teeth. I'll give you an estimate. So my husband's there with me, so we, we get the estimate and the assistant goes over the estimate with us and um, says, your cat has gingivitis and she needs some teeth out and she has all these other problems and the cost is gonna be like 100 times more than what a cleaning cost in my office. So I come out and I, and I said, you know, it's kind of funny because I'm a dentist, you know, and, and the vet did not explain anything about my cat's condition. They just basically gave me an estimate. So um, we came out and, and um, we looked at the estimate. It was like, oh, you know, for a cleaning and we came home and we 
made a, a, an appointment to go to a second opinion. And um, talk about marketing, I used one of the little Valpac things for a free exam at this other vet. So I go in and there's another female dentist in this, uh, another female vet at this other office and um, she does an exam and she tells me, really good communication, your cat does have problems. Because I was like, are you kidding me? You know, I think they're just snowing me. I'm a dentist and you know, they're telling me my cat has all these major issues. So the second one says, yes, you do, your cat does have problems. And um, actually, um, you need to go to a dental specialist who's a vet. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, it goes from needing a cleaning to major, major problems. So anyway, she was more communicative. I understood things. And I went to the dental specialist this past weekend and my cat had to have some teeth removed and so it's a vet that only does dentistry? You know who it is? It's the vet, Dr. Visser, who does the zoo animals. And um, Can you send me his link? Dr. Visser. Well, he's got to tell him to come on the show. I've uh, never you know had it, it was so, a vet. I, actually, that's what, I think there was a reason why I, I did not have the communication with my first vet, because I ended up with talking to Dr. Visser. Excellent, nice guy, South African guy. His son is a dentist. And, in the uh, valley? In the valley. And Who's his son? I, his last name is Visser. Send, send me both. And so anyway, um, at the end of everything, my cat had to have major surgery, and, and she's like moping around like she has her wisdom teeth out <laughs> this weekend. But um, he was so nice. He explained everything, had video, had you know, information that he sent me home with. So make a long story short, I spent twice as much as I would have with the first vet but I felt like the communication was there. He was, you know, caring, helpful, and spent the time with me, and I'm gonna have him come to the Arizona dental meeting to do a, a lecture. Mister, <laughs> yeah. Mister, are you really? Yeah. And, and what's he gonna lecture on? Just, just, just the FYI. Probably the dental, the dental um, arena, because pets do have major periodontal problems. My cat had periodontal issues. She's two years old, and so, um, and there was resorption and erosion and decay, all of these things on the cat. But you would think that a dental pet would not have the same issues. You know, a dentist pet may not have the same issues. Well, you know, you know why we we did. should not like cats. Why? Because I love I love cats. Um, when um, I've always uh, growing up, we always had two or three cats. But um, so when they start doing the human genome, uh -huh. you know, like when. Um, they started doing that. I mean, it was billions of dollars and took a decade to get through one set of chromosomes, right? Now, the technology is so much faster, easier, lower cost, cheaper, better. Now they're doing, um, they're doing the, the genomes of uh, all kinds of plants and animals. Turns out, um, I read a, a paper on a genome that, that they always wondered where the streptococcus mutans in our mouth came from dental decay. And um, it, it, they definitely say they can measure permutations per hundred genes to get a time length on them. Mm -hmm. They say Homo sapien picked up streptococcus mutans from a cat in the fertile crust about 15,000 years ago. Wow. And somebody was kissing a cat and that's how it entered our population. Hmm. And uh, so- So don't uh, kiss your cat. <laughs> well, actually, a lot of herd diseases all come from other animals. The greatest um, death in America was, uh, the greatest crime scene in the world was the Spanish influenza. And they tracked it all the way back from, a, a, in Kansas, a pig gave it to a young boy. Then he was recruited for World War I, went to Leavenworth, which had the first breakout. Mm -hmm. And then those guys were shipped out. But anyway, it followed the, tr the ship uh, um, troops Trail. of mm -hmm. World War I. Wow. And, then, um, and then what was really sad is then, um, as it got into effect, the um, United States Postal Service, like there would be an island and they would only get their mail once a month. And then the, the guy would come and deliver the mail. Hmm. And then in the following two weeks, five to 10% of the, everyone Population. on the island would die. Oh, wow. And, uh, and today, and the reason that's so scary is because today, that was a century ago. Today, there's 27,000 international flights a day. So that slow moving um, epidemic <laughs> would be the whole planet in a day. Right. The whole planet would have that in a day. But uh, yeah, cats are uh, um, amazing. I always uh, have a lot of cat jokes, but uh, I, <laughs> I always love cats. And uh, so did, were you tempted to just uh, save your money and eat the cat and just have a good meal? 
No, my was husband was my husband was trying to understand why we went from a low lower estimate that we thought was high at the time to go and spend twice as much to get the cat taken care of at a different place. He he wondered where the wisdom was in that, but I think the neatest thing with the uh, the dental vets is um, had no idea until we lectured in um, Africa and Tanzania that one of the number one causes of death in the Serengeti is as soon as the hippo's teeth wears down, they starve to death and die. Hmm. And so they live so much longer in captivity because they go in there and do root canals and post oh. buildups and crowns. But if you're a hippo, as soon as your tooth's worn down, it's over. If you're a cat and you break your canine off on a kill, you go away and starve to death. But teeth are one of the biggest deals for life expectancy. You know, what was, what was also interesting when I was talking to Dr. Visser on the, um, on the cats, I said, do you do work on the animals that are in the zoo? And he goes, oh, and he goes and he gets his iPad and he comes back and he shows me he just worked on a jaguar, you know, this past week. And uh, he said, so I did a root canal on him and I'll be doing a crown. I said, do you do same day crowns? And he goes, my son's a dentist. And so then it brought in the CEREC and all these other things. So it was really interesting because they do a lot of the same things on the animals that we do on humans. So that's when I thought, I've got to get him to speak at the dental convention. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there, I mean, there, so dentistry, uh, dental down has 50 categories. And one of them is dental subspecialties. And one of the subspecialties is veterinary dentistry. And there's hundreds of cases. Uh, I've posted a lot of his work oh. um, when it shows up in the deal. I mean, where they're doing, you know, um, 50 centimeter root canals. Yes, exactly. And How did like, they get those wow. files, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is really, really um, cool. And and vets are um, under a, a tremendous amount of stress because a lot of uh, dentists don't realize this, but um, since everyone loves animals, the hardest thing to get accepted to is vet school, not medical school, mm. not dental school. And they, um, they, I mean, there's so many people who decided when they were 10 years old they were going to be a vet, and they didn't let any money or anything stand in their way. So they come out with more debt than dental students, hmm. but their jobs, I mean, they're only getting like 65000 a year. So you look at a dentist servicing that debt, making 175000 a year. You know, a lot of dentists, they whine to me about the three fifty, and I'm like, well, would you pay $2 to get a job that makes a dollar a year? That's pretty reasonable. Mm -hmm. But they're paying 350000 to get a job that pays 65000 a year. So 300 and uh, so let's take that. Uh, uh, so $350,000 divided by $65,000, that's five years. So you have to, so that, being a vet is a very emotional decision. You love cats. You love mm -hmm. dogs. You want to do that your whole life. And remember when... Um, Remember back in the day when they had indentured servants, like they would take you uh, to the new country, but you had to work free on their farm for seven years? Mm -hmm. You're basically an indentured servant. I mean, you're going you're gonna to go be a vet for five years Before. for nothing, just trying to yeah. pay it back, whereas a dentist is two years. Um, you also um, talk about uh, finding a balance. Drive. You uh, have been successfully married for, what, 30 years? No, um, 27 Close 27. to 30. Mm -hmm. And um, what, how, um, what advice would you give on the work-life balance? I would say that it's very important to um, find a way to relieve your stress, whether it is through exercise, not drinking, of course, you know, anything to moderation. You can have drinks, but not in excess. But to exercise and um, eat right, sleep well, just try to do all the things they tell you you should do but find the time for you, um, whether it's early in the morning or late at night, to kind of relieve your stress. You're a hiker. I mean, I've seen mm -hmm. you put. I mean, you're always posting pictures of hiking. Yeah, we we live in an area where we have the mountain trails right behind us, and so um, and plus, my husband and I have Fitbits, so we have to get our steps every day. And How many steps do you try to get every day? Ten thousand. That's which cool. Is, yeah, I think it's like about five miles. And, and so it just makes you get out and do things outside or if, you know, you, you have a treadmill. But we like to go outside. And then we did take um, a couple hiking trips. Um, That's right, Grand Canyon. We did, I did Grand Canyon with the Maddows. Yep. Well, actually, Dave Maddo. And um, then my husband and I did um, Machu Picchu, Peru. With the Maddows, too? 
No, just with us. We did one of those REI trips, and that was a lot of fun. REI? REI. You know REI Recreational? Um, you mean the, the Sporting Goods store? store? Yeah. Sporting Goods store. They had a trip, and you meet the people that from all over the U.S. or all over the world, I don't know, um, at the facility in Peru, and then they take you on guided hikes through the back country of Peru. And so we ended up at Machu Picchu, though we saw a number of different ruins from the Inca time of years, years, years ago. And now I just um, saw an update on that. They're um, finding many, many more via satellite. They got a new satellite uh, wow. software. And so um, in jungles, and, mm -hmm. and they're saying, look at that, here's this big city. And I think I saw that same thing. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. really um, cool. Yeah. Um, what, what do you say, uh, talk, talk about cell phones and social media. You say your practice can't thrive without cell phones and social media. So you know how phones never used to be a priority. They used to be flip phones. You, all you do is speak on a phone. So over the years, now there are many computers. So you don't need as much um, you know, to use it for a phone by itself. Um, you can use it to play social media. You need to, um, to do, um, get reviews and things like that on social media. That's the way that people actually look for practices. They'll use their phone much more so than any other way. And if you have good reviews, you will have people coming in strictly because they look online and they see good reviews. And so they choose your practice over somebody who doesn't have good reviews or is not, doesn't have a social presence. Yeah, I noticed, uh, speaking of views, um, Paul Allen's interview 10 years ago that this Steve Jobs iPhone thing was a joke. Wow. Um, I, think that, <laughs> I think that interview is up to 10 million views. And it was pretty cool because I was, I was watching that interview because, um, I mean, I, I got a lot of those predictions. Right. I remember I was freshman year at Creighton. Um, me, remember Joe Dovkin, the end of from Paradise Valley? Yes. Who passed away a couple years ago? Mm -hmm. Um, we were sitting up there with Randy Kerwin, who's a dentist in Kansas, and Gary and the Saldi, who's a dentist in Hawthorne. And this guy down the hall, and Paul Gosar was in that dorm. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I went to, I, I lived in Swanson Hall at Creighton with Paul Gosar, U.S. Congressman. And this guy named Dave Heilman came and showed us this computer from, I think it was Tandy or, or yeah, who knows? Radio Shack. <laughs> and he was a computer major, and we were all pre-dent. And everybody on that floor was pre-dent, pre-med, or pre-law. And here's this, this computer guy, and we're trying to be polite, and he's showing us all this and everything. When he left, we all just wow. died laughing. Like, <laughs> what an idiot. Why would you get be, get a degree in Fortran and Cobalt and computer sciences? What are you, dumb, deaf, and blind? Yeah, I just missed the biggest bull market ever. <laughs> uh, I can still remember uh, walking into uh, National Bank, which on my dad, and they just saw the ATM machine. I think it was like in the early 70s, and we thought, what idiot would want to stand out here with this stupid machine when Shirley's right in there to help you and she's nice and get a candy sucker and we go in there and do our banking, we come out and that guy's still, you know, going through all these steps and we're up there and we're talking to him and saying, why don't you just go inside? And he, no, I don't, and, and my dad and I said, yeah, that, that idea will never take off. And that was the ATM was the biggest thing. Another one is, um, oh, I, I missed so many things. So I get it, but um, do you remember, um, what year your first cell phone was? Because when I was watching that interview, I was trying to think when, because mine was a Motorola. All yeah. it did was, it was a flip phone. All mine it did was, was a call. flip phone. Do you remember what year? It had to be um, probably in the early 90s. Probably in the early 90s. Yeah. Um, they used to be big too. Remember the real big phones? Oh <laughs> they looked God. like walkie-talkies. the phones came out, <laughs> came out they were, it was like a brick. <laughs> And they were originally um, to your wired to a briefcase yeah. or a car. <laughs> and I used to always say, and my dad used to say the same thing. He goes, all you got to do is go to any gas station. You don't even have to get out of your car. You just roll down the window, put a dime in. There's your there's phone. There's your pay phone, right? Yeah. And I remember <laughs> when I was lecturing, um, I started lecturing in 90. I remember that one of the most important things on a, on a layover flight is that you, you have to, the reason I sat in first, even though I'm only five foot seven and you know, when you're five foot seven, coach is first class. You know, when your feet, <laughs> when your feet don't touch the ground, you don't need first class. But the the only reason I would buy first class is because if you weren't in the first four or five rows, then when you came out and went to the payphones, they were all taken. 
And if you sat in coach, if you if you were in row 10 or 15, you had no phone on a layover in Chicago or Dallas or Atlanta. Mm -hmm. You know, they they only had, you know, the 10, 15 Rows of pay phones. phones and and you'd be and, and you always tried to guilt the guy on the phone, you're always trying to stand behind him going, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> Done yet? <laughs> and you know, there were people who, you know, businessmen who wanted to talk to their spouse and kids on the phone and all that stuff, but man, crazy thing. Final question, you promised me an hour of your life, um, we're at hour 10, final question. Um, tips for financial success in your practice and life, I mean, they, they, they became a dentist to have a better job and career and financial success, but they come out with 350,000. Um, what, what advice would you give them? So this um, is topic is not necessarily things to make their debt go away, but things that in the practice maybe make things easier, such as accepting EFTs instead of getting paper checks, things that... The EFTs, e they're in electro school. Electronic fund transfers from the insurance companies. So if you sign up with the insurance companies to have the funds transferred into your bank account, you save some time getting the return on your money from the insurance claims much faster than if you would wait for the mail to come with the check in the mail. Um, we also have a check scanner. And so instead of having to go to the bank to deposit any of the checks that either patients write or the insurance companies do send you, we have a scanner where we just have to scan the checks so you can do away with going to the bank on it. Who do you bank with? Chase. Yeah, so do I. You know, it seems, it seems like most people, like, like if I told my team they had to change to like, uh, say, Bank of America, Mm -hmm. they, 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 would, they would probably just beat me up. I mean, the, the, the Chase <laughs> software, I, I, it's so much more intuitive and easy to use mm -hmm. uh, than uh, so many of the other banks. Chase, Chase is really, really good on I think business. I've used the variety of the banks, um, not only for business, but personally. And so Chase is good. Wells Fargo's not so good. Right. <laughs> Wells Fargo's not good. And when you talk to people doing online banking with Bank of America, they call it Skank of America. Oh, really? <laughs> and um, Chase, I mean, Chase is like the, the apple of the online banking. I mean, they really... It's very intuitive. It's got to be intuitive. Mm -hmm. And um, um, Wells Fargo and Bank of America is probably more like the uh, Microsoft of the online Absolutely, banking. Absolutely, yeah. You I know? agree. I mean, what, I mean, I mean... It's still hard for me to like Bill Gates. I mean, I do. I like him now. He's been out of Microsoft. He's, you know, he's, he's a great he's guy. He's very philanthropic. I like but, what he does. But with gosh, <laughs> the first 20 years, every time that asshole sold me <laughs> software, I had to get an IT guy who's riddled with yes, bugs. I know. And it's like I'd pay like 250 for Gates' shitty software. Mm -hmm. And then you'd have to pay someone $2,000 to get to all the bugs out of it. Fixed. And to this day... My IT team says, no, 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 they just came out with that update. We're not touching it for six months to a year. Mm -hmm. It's shit, it's trash, mm -hmm. but Apple, Apple, it's I've it's, converted it's everything never. except my office to I Apple. I know, but there, I mean, Apple, I mean, Steve Jobs said, quality, quality, quality. And Jobs just said, money, I mean, and Bill Gates was just money, 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 just sell that shit. And, and everybody on his team would say, it's not ready, give us more time, no. Sales, our quarterly earnings, profit, and he basically um, screwed all of his customers for for twenty. That's the way I feel. And now I'm sitting there, I'm trying to listen to him. It's like, uh, I mean, that's the guy <laughs> I wanted to strangle for twenty years, and now he's like this great philanthropist. But um, uh, man, um, ah. Sorry for that rant. But but do you remember those days? Oh, yes. I, and I know that... And if, you don't, time, if you don't understand what I'm saying, talk to any 50-year-old programmer. <laughs> what do you think of uh, Microsoft software in the 80s and 90s? Was it ready to be released, or was it still filled with bugs? It was always filled with bugs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so the millennials, if you're under 30... Uh, you just don't understand that. Yeah, yeah. But he is really <laughs> a great guy right now. Uh -huh. But, man, it was... Uh, um, anyway, um, it, more financial advice. Um, Any other uh, tips for financial success in your practice and life? You said EFTs? Mm -hmm. EFTs, the check scanner. Um, I would have meetings, uh, morning huddles, and office meetings on a regular basis just to 
uh, see where your practice is on certain percentages, where you should be and where your practice is, so you know how to gauge where you need to spend time. Get somebody who's really good to do financial arrangements and treatment planning um, with your patients so they understand, so you don't have the vet thing where I get the estimate, but I don't really know why it's so high. It's so bizarre because these kids believe, like I believe, that if you went to Creighton and you got A's in geometry and calculus and physics and all, that was the secret to success. Mm -hmm. But you know when they come out of school, the ones that have a personality, the ones that can communicate, the ones, all the soft, if you get an A on the soft, fluffy stuff, you can be a horrible dentist, all your work fails, not take any online CE and have a million dollar practice. Mm -hmm. But if you're the best dentist north of the um, equator and you can't communicate to your patients it, uh, and problem. your staff and, or your spouse, right? I mean, it's the same problem you're gonna take at home with your wife and kids, same one with your team, same one with your patients. Mm -hmm. You either have to be a great communicator or life is very challenging. I agree. And that's why I decided to live with uh, cats <laughs> and I will not remarry unless it's a droid. I'm waiting for uh, C-3PO's sister to come out. And uh, seriously, buddy, thank you so much for coming Thank you by. for having me.